Hey guys, I want to go through this article. It's orthodox problems with penal substitution. And I'm not going to say that I agree or disagree with all these, but I'll probably comment as I go over them. But uh, let's just go through some of them, or all of them. The penal substitution view was completely absent from the church over a thousand years. It was only in the 11th century that Anselm of Canterbury began to introduce the groundwork for this kind of theology to the West. And so, I mean, from what I've read a lot, they, like if you go to Wikipedia or other websites, it says that Anselm taught satisfaction theory and that later penal substitution developed from that. And so, but then a lot of places are blaming Anselm directly for the penal substitution theory, even though there's articles like one I just made a video on that says that, you know, he was in contrast to it. But either way, I, I don't know. I'm just... You know, I'm interested in the satisfaction theory, but, uh, you know, this Anselm guy's name keeps popping up, and I don't know the, the history on this, only, you know, what I'm reading from different sites. Anyways, even here it says, nor was it fully developed into the doctrine we know now as penal substitution until the 16th century reformers came along. To this day, it has been accepted in the East. No, it has never been accepted in the East, or it never been fully accepted by Roman Catholics. Okay. This is probably an article written by Roman Catholics. Either way, it doesn't mean that all their arguments are wrong or that all their arguments are right, or either way. Okay. Number one, penal substitution compromises the deity of Christ and puts a rift in the Trinity. That's something I've talked about a lot that seems kind of obvious. If Christ died for and is our solution to our sins against God the Father, then what about our sins against Christ? He's just as good as the Father is, or our sins against the Holy Spirit. With penal substitution, God is pitted against God, either dividing God and thus destroying the Trinity, or saying Christ isn't fully God. It's an interesting take on it. But, you know, I'd say that it, it pits God against God when, you know, or person against person when it's saying that the Father pours out his wrath on the Son, or that, you know, that the Father forsakes the Son, as some believe. With penal substitution, God is bound by necessity. This is an interesting one. I don't know if I agree with this argument or not, but if God's justice demands that he punish sin, there is no higher force than God. There, there is a higher force than God necessity, which determines that God can and cannot do. Calvinists will be quick to argue. No justice is an aspect of God's nature, and there is no necessity laid on him from outside his nature. The problem, though, is that if I do A, then God must do B. If I sin, God must punish. He does not have the freedom to do otherwise, thus God's actions are bound and controlled by something outside of himself. Example, my actions. This becomes even more confusing if we add the Calvinistic notion that God foreordained my sinful actions in the first place, thus forcing him to respond to them. Furthermore, it is often argued by the Reformed that God is sovereign and doesn't have to save anyone if he chooses not to. On the other hand, he does have to punish sin, so God has to punish sin, but he doesn't have to save sinners. It's very interesting that justice, or at least what reforms see as justice, becomes the defining characteristic of God rather than love. Justice forces God to respond to our actions, but love does not. So, that's an interesting argument, but I don't know what to say about that. I need to think about that one a little more. Penal substitution misunderstands the Old Testament sacrifices. Again, this is interesting. The old sacrificial system was not a picture of penal substitution. God was not pouring out his wrath on the animals in place of the Israelites. He didn't vent, vent his righteous judgment on the animals, sending them to hell in the place of the Israelites. On the contrary, they were killed honorably and as pain, painlessly as possible. Their life, their blood, was offered to God as a sweet-smelling aroma. The, result, the resulting meat was good and holy, not just worthless carry-on fit for dogs and vultures. Such is also the case with Christ's sacrifice. It is a holy offering of blood to the Father, not a means whereby God can vent his wrath. Okay. Number four, penal substitution misunderstands the word justice. Uh, <clears throat> and I tried to explain this maybe earlier. This might be kind of what I was thinking of. I've heard from other sources, but a quick perusal of the Psalms and prophets will reveal that the word justice is usually coupled with mercy. Justice really means to show kindness and deliverance to the oppressed and to right the wrongs done to them. 
True justice is destroying our oppressors, sin, death, and Satan, not punishing us for the sins to which we are in bondage. He's saying to true justice from God, I guess, would be destroying our, our, our oppressors, sin, death, and Satan, not punishing us for the sins which we are in bondage. Penal substitution misunderstands the word propitiation. Propitiation should not be thought of in the classical pagan sense as if our God were some angry deity who needing, needed appeasing and could only be satisfied through a penal sacrifice. It's really quite different. Uh, propitiation is also translated mercy seat. The mercy seat covered the Ark of the Covenant, which contained a copy of the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. the law. Well, the law cried out against us and demanded perfection and showed us our shortcomings. The mercy seat covered those demands and our failure to live up to them. The mercy seat, was the mercy seat punished for our sins? Of course not. Likewise, Christ's blood was not the punished, punishment demanded by justice, but rather the ultimate mercy seat covering and forgiving our sins. This is why propitiation is sometimes more accurately trans, translated as expiation in some versions of the Bible. says expiation implies the removal of our sins, while propitiation implies appeasing an angry deity. With penal substitution, God does not show unconditional love. With penal substitution, God himself does not show the unconditional love that he commands us to show one another. There is a big condition attached. God must have an outlet to vent his wrath. His self-giving love is only made possible by his self-satisfying justice. With penal substitution, God does not truly forgive. With penal substitution, the debt is not really forgiven, it's just transferred. But we are commanded to forgive as God forgave us. If my brother offends me, should I demand justice and vent my wrath on someone else? Should I beat myself up? No, obviously we are simply let we are to simply let it go and graciously accept the offense. With penal substitution, God changes. According to penal substitution, God is angry with us because of our sins, but once he expresses his wrath in his son, he is no longer angry with us. Now he loves us as he loves his own son. In other words, he changes. First he's angry with us, then he changes his mind and decides to love us. But how can this be if God is love? How can a God who is infinite self-giving love ever vary in his degree of love towards us? Besides, not only is God love, he's also unchanging and doesn't change his mind. Penal substitution makes the resurrection unnecessary. According to penal substitution, salvation is made possible only by a legal exchange. We are counted just and forgiven only because God's wrath has been poured out on Christ instead. Since hell is said to be a punishment for, our, for sins, and since our sins have already been punished in Christ, we are free to go to heaven. The resurrection then becomes simply a nice bonus, nothing more than a proof that Christ is divine. Hmm. Penal substitution makes the incarnation unnecessary. Was it Christ's physical suffering or spiritual suffering which atoned for our sins? According to penal substitution, if physical, then anyone who has suffered physically more than Christ, and there have been plenty in the history of our race, and exempt from hell, is exempt from hell, since they already paid for their own sins. If it was Christ's spiritual suffering that counts, then he didn't need to be incarnate. After all, the demons will be punished without needing bodies. The incarnation becomes just an add-on to help us out a little more. One person cannot be punished for another. Contra penal substitution, the Bible tells us that one person cannot be punished for another. Each shall die for his own sins. In, the, in those days they shall say no more. The fathers have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But everyone shall die for his own iniquity. Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. The person shall be put to death for his own sin. The soul who, went, who sins shall die. The son shall not bear guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The, righteous, the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. And I know I'm not reading these verses, these chapters out and stuff, because they're on the screen, and I'm just trying to read through this quicker. <clears throat>
Uh, penal substitution makes death a punishment rather than a result. God said, "On the day that you eat the fruit, you, sh you will surely die." Genesis chapter two, verse seventeen. He did not say, "I will kill you," but rather, "You will die." To walk away from God or to sin is, by definition, death. Death in the realm of not God. Likewise, if I pull the plug in my own life support system, the result is death. No one else is killing me. If I jump off the roof after being warned by my mother not to, and I end up breaking my leg, does that mean my brother, my mother, broke my leg? No. That was simply the result of my own choice. Christ gave himself up to death. If death is an act of punishment from God, then Christ was punished by his Father for penal substitution. But if death is the result of sin, then it is an outside enemy and not God's own wrath. Penal substitution undermines union with Christ. If, if, if death is a punishment for sin rather than a result of sin, continuing with the last point, then it makes little sense to speak of being united with Christ. St. Paul said that we are united together in the likeness of his death. He also says, I have been crucified with Christ. If death is a punishment, then St. Paul is saying, Christ and I have been punished together. But again, why would two people be punished for one person's sins? Perhaps it makes more sense to say that Christ, in union with our humanity, experienced the consequence of death, and through his death, defeated death for all of us. Besides, if we really believe that Christ defeated death, then we certainly can't say that death is a punishment sent from God, or else we'd be forced to say that Christ defeated something that God willed for us. But Christ and his Father are not at war with each other. On the other hand, I will certainly confess that there is a substitution as well. Christ experienced the consequence of sin, death, as a substitute for us, so that we don't have to experience the ultimate consequence of sin, eternal death. But note that Christ is taking on the consequence of sin in our place rather than the punishment for sin in our place. That's very interesting. See, I like a lot of this, at least to think on. Um, it brings up some really good points and questions. Penal substitution was absent from the entire church, both east and west, for at least a thousand years. To quote from Theogeek blog site, If the apostles taught penal substitution as a central part of their gospel, then it seems almost entirely inconvincible or inconceivable that the generations that came after them and spoke the same language had worldwide managed to universally forget the major and central part of the gospel and replace it with something else entirely. So what was Christ's death for, if not to satisfy God's justice? The purpose of Christ's atonement was to defeat death and forgive us of our sins. It was the presenting of Christ's blood, his humanity, to the Father to restore the unity that we had broken. It was a sweet-smelling aroma, aroma of sacrifice acceptable to God. The death and purpose of the sacrifice is far beyond the scope of this little book, but one thing is for sure that it was not about punishment. And when punishment is taken out of the equation, things look much different. We can no longer say that Christ was punished in place of John, but not in place of, say, Judas. But we can say that Christ defeated death for both John and Judas, both of whom will be resurrected regardless of their acceptance or rejection of Christ. Hmm. Well, I'd like to hear you guys' uh, comments on this, if, if you caught any of that, or go check out the article for yourself at Preacher's Institute, and or just Google search for Orthodox Problems with Penal Substitution, you'll find this article. And uh, what do you think about some of these points? So that's basically why I'm making this video, to share it with anybody who watches this and get other people's ideas. And I mean, there's a lot there that I'll have to break down myself to, um, to look at. But there seems to be some valid points here and maybe some that aren't so valid. But God bless.